Hello, good evening. Welcome to News at 10 on TV3 on Wednesdays. It is The Stands and it is coming to you live from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. My name is Martin Isidu Dati. Later to this evening, I'll be joined by Stephen Enti and also uh, who he is host uh, of uh, the Sunrise Morning Show on 3FM 92.7 and also Rosina Foster, a producer at sister station Unmia FM. Before we delve into discussions for this evening, here are the highlights of today's stories. New Patriotic Party, former member of parliament for Mampong, Francis Adainimo, is unhappy over what he says are attempts to prevent him from picking nomination forms to contest in the party's parliamentary uh, primaries. The aspirant says several attempts to get the forms had failed as he was being denied access and obstructed from purchasing the forms at the Mampong constituency office of the party. Uh, away from that, the first witness in the case involving the state and the chairman of the NDC, Samuel Ofuswampo, and deputy communications director of the party, Kweku Buahin, has denied his own witness statement in court. The witness, Benjamin Osei Ampo for J, who is a broadcast journalist with Adum FM, however, acknowledged his signature on the statement when he appeared to testify against the two accused persons. And uh, the presidential advisor on health, Dr. Anthony Insiasare, has described the enhanced surveillance mechanisms as best practice in checking the coronavirus. He was reacting to concerns on uh, safety measures, including the quarantine of suspected cases some countries have adopted since its outbreak in China, where over 100 people have so far died. And uh, government requires in excess of 30 billion CDs to construct and rehabilitate roads across the country, of which part will be used to pay contractors for completed projects. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, made this known at the opening of a retreat for road contractors in Accra. So those are the major stories making headlines here in Ghana. Let's find out what's happening elsewhere around the world. And we are starting from uh, what the World Health Organization has been saying about the coronavirus which broke out in China. So the World Health Organization's Emergency Committee will meet on Thursday, the third time in a week, to evaluate whether the new coronavirus spreading from China now constitutes an international emergency. The death toll rose to 132, which is still lower than the 348 people who were killed in China by the SARS virus or severe acute respiratory syndrome um, some years ago. Also, neighboring Nigeria, the Consumer Protection Agency in Nigeria says it has closed down a Chinese-owned supermarket selling illegally imported seafood and meat in the capital Abuja over ongoing fears about the spread of the coronavirus. The Federal uh, Competition and Consumer Protection Commission said they made the discovery during a surprise inspection. To the, to the UK now, the European Parliament on Wednesday gave its final approval to Britain's divorce deal from the bloc, paving way for Brexit to take place on Friday. Uh, MPs ratified the Brexit withdrawal agreement by 621 votes to 49 following an emotional debate in Brussels. And uh, the Pentagon has said that the number of troops suffering from traumatic brain injuries after an Iranian attack on a US base in Iraq on the 8th of January has risen to 50. The new total is 16 more than previously announced. President Donald Trump initially said no Americans were injured and cited this in his decision not to retaliate against Iran. So those are the stories making headlines both locally and uh, internationally. Time now for the major issues we'll be discussing later on the stands uh, on News at 10. So Friday, January 31, will mark exactly one year after the Ayawasu West Wogan violence, a by-election that was supposed to elect a new person to replace a member of parliament of the area who had passed on was marred by violence. Some masked national security operatives assaulted scores of people, including the member of parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George. 
a commission of inquiry was set up uh, by the president to probe the violence. After the commission concluded its work, government issued a white paper accepting and rejecting portions of the key recommendations by the ML Shot Commission. With less than 10 months uh, for Ghana to go to the polls, that's the general elections, question is, have we learned enough to avert a recurrence of the Ayawasu West Wagon by election violence in the upcoming elections? That is the major question we'll be delving into and taking our, po our, point, uh, taking our positions on later on the show. So let's watch this package, um, uh, which also unfolds in terms of the events that happened on the day. And then also later my colleagues will join me and we'll see how we can uh, delve into this matter shortly. Just hours into the by-election, some armed men clothed in national security apparel stormed the La Baleche Presby polling station. Eyewitnesses say the armed men fired shots and attacked some agents believed to be from the position NDC. The men, according to eyewitnesses, also stormed the home of NDC candidate Lali Fukwesi Brimpong. A video footage also emerged depicting NDC Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Samuel George, being heckled and attacked by masked men wielding guns. This action by the national security operatives was severely criticized, prompting the president to institute a commission of inquiry to investigate the matter. It's totally inappropriate and unacceptable. It's not sufficient for us to just for you to bring them and deposit it at the Secretariat, you must go and bring them and testify before us. All right, so that's just a... Uh you know, taking you down memory lane and how things unfolded on the 31st of January last year. And it's almost a year. We are going to talk about it and make sure that we are clearly aware as a people and then as government, the key lessons that we've learned from that incident and make sure it does not recur in uh, the 2020 elections, the general elections later in December. Let me introduce my uh, colleagues now. I nearly said guests, but you are uh, certainly not guests. <laughs> we are guests, uh, no, of course. Yeah, you're, you're not guests. <laughs> On my immediate left, you have Rosina Foster. She's an editor with our sister station, Onuia mm -hmm. FM. And then also uh, Stephen Nt, co-host of Sunrise Morning Show on 3FM 92.7. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining me late this evening. To start with, uh, maybe Steve, I'll start with you. Yes. Do you think that um, we have learned any lessons at all from the uh, IRS West Wagon by election violence? Well, that's a subjective question. I mean, who has learned the lessons? Whether security agencies have, uh, whether journalists have, whether the electoral body has, we don't know because that demonstration has not been made yet because we're preparing to go into an election. And what we want to see is that the, the, the situations that uh, resulted in the eruption of the violence in Ayawas of Central do not repeat themselves. But we cannot tell until things really get... Uh, dire and we can tell you know what I mean so uh, if we look at the way uh, agitations have been ongoing for the electoral roll mm -hmm. agitations against the compilation of a new voters register I think that overall the uh, the the parties involved the inter-party coalition against the compilation of the voters register have comported themselves I mean mm -hmm. they haven't breached any uh, security infractions yeah. or yeah. Uh, they, they made any scenes for us to have doubts that they will conduct themselves uh, properly mm. when we go into an election. I will look at the security agencies. Uh, they've been up to the task. I mean, the police service has been uh, tackling violence. Have uh, they? They, they? have. have I, they? I reckon. I mean, I mean I, I'm saying this been. from the point of view of uh, mass mobilization. If we look right. at how they disperse the agitated teachers who masked up by the uh, Ministry of Education demanding payment of one mm. thing or the other, they are seen to be showing that they are up for it. But what I don't know is how different they will act if mm. this became an election matter. Okay. So right now we just have to we wait, just and have see. To wait and see. Mm. Rosina? Yeah, I think that the upcoming elections will be the best litmus test to know whether mm. or not we've learned our lessons. And for me, um, I, I, will, I will hasten a bit 
to be very um, <coughs> optimistic about the whole thing mm. because some of the things that the um, the recommendations that were made by the um, commission the short the, the no short, short commission, commission yeah. you know government rejected about 58 percent of them <laughs> even more you know and they brought up issues about um, some clear cut, um, clear cut guidelines, especially with um, the Ministry of National Security, that they wanted um, their um, operations, you know, chain of command and yeah, everything clearly, clearly, clearly spelled yes, out. Yes, you know, yes. this thing has not been done, and it wouldn't be done because government rejected that bit about um, of the um, the, the report. report. Mm. You know, and people have, let me say, political parties in general over the years have shown that they do not trust these security mm. agencies. Why do they not trust these security agencies? Because they know from the practices that they've been engaging in over the years that when they come into power, they bring their own people. They recruit them, you know, party faithfuls so, into security services. So they, the, so, the, 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 the political parties themselves know that they know. we can't trust the security agencies sure. because whenever we are in power, whichever government is in power at any point in time, mm, sure. they put their people there, sure. you know, and, they, why is and these things are still ongoing, yeah. you know, so they wouldn't want to wreck it, if I should put it that way, to trust the police or any of these security agencies too much. And to resolve some of these issues, underlying factors, I don't think that um, this issue about vigilantism, we've come up with this vigilant, uh, vigilantism um, laws no, and all yeah. that. We, throw, we are a country that throws a lot of laws around our problems, you know, but I don't think that is the um, solution to the problem that we have now. Mm. It, it wouldn't be that there is a law, you know, and that people, would, people are going to uh, act in a particular way. The laws are good, yeah. fine, mm. but um, I doubt if well, there are maybe as a as a reminder. Let's uh, go through the terms of reference that yeah. was given to the commission, mm. and then we will look at uh, why government decided to reject a number of them. So it was clearly stated to the commission that one, make a full, faithful, and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events and associated violence during the Ayawaso West Wagon by election on the 31st uh, day of January 2019. Also, identify any person responsible for or who has been involved in the events associated with the violence and injuries. And then uh, the third um, term of reference was to inquire into any matter which the commission considers incidental or res reasonable reasonably related to the causes of the events and associated violence and injuries. And then the fourth uh, term was to submit within one month its report to the president giving reasons yeah. for its findings and recommendations, including appropriate sanctions, if any, the statement explained. So with these terms of reference, I mean, we've also had the, the, um, the opportunity to peruse yeah. the final report yeah. from the commission. When do you think the commission fell short of what was expected? I wouldn't say that the commission fell short in any way. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a, this this was a political violence. You can call it that way yeah. because it was a by-election. Uh, the stakes were very high for both sides, and uh, the commission did the work it was supposed to do. I mean, I I am not going to put the reputation of someone like um, uh, Short, ML Short, on the line to say yeah. that yeah. they didn't do a thorough job. We saw how the screenings went. We yeah. saw how the questioning went. Journalists were brought before the panel. Everybody was brought in. Questions were asked. Recommendations were made. So I. I think that and the sitting was also public. The sitting was public, yeah. so the, the the whole thing was in the glare of the public view, and you would know that the NDC initially was skeptical about cooperating, yeah. but when they saw how it was going and uh, the impartialness, uh, if I could call it that way, they submitted themselves to the process, and it went on. So I wouldn't say the commission didn't do a, a thorough job. Mm. I think the commission did what a commission of its kind, with the we'll members that. they had will do and they did a brilliant job if yeah. you ask me what I, I i still find hard to to acknowledge is the fact that government picked and choose which of the recommendations of the committee yeah. uh, it will accept and that was the beginning that's just that's the beginning of all the the doubt yeah. that has been created in the minds of political opponents yeah, because and I mean, they're making a big capital out yeah, of it going right, into the election. right at the moment the commission was put together i think there was a general um 
sigh of relief that, okay, let's support this team and see how best they can come exactly. up with the sure. right recommendations. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. whichever party is in power, whichever time uh, where, you know, the country will be in, that these recommendations will be followed. Mm. You know, and I think that, I mean, the, both parties were okay with the commission. They actually followed with keen interest the uh, submissions that were made, the line of questioning. Then the white paper came. Mm. Yes. That was what threw people into, into all sorts mm. of doubt. Why, why yeah. would you yeah. pick and choose which ones yeah. work yeah. for you yeah. or against you? And why would you pick out some people and say, yes, they should go ahead and be, mm. you know, be sanctioned and you leave others yes. out? That is where... And then you see, also so, threw so doubt I, on I, I the likes of Justice I feel that it became like a, a sweeping under the carpet, the, the problem of vigilantism, which mm. has been with us for ages. Yeah. I mean, we have been in this country where uh, ballot boxes have been snatched away and all sorts of things have been done. It's not to suggest that we haven't seen um, the, the violence, the magnitude of Ayawaso. We saw it coming yeah. because every election year, the stakes are high, the tensions are raised. These are the things that make people that much agitated and all boils down to the winner takes all yeah. thing. Everybody is fighting for their own turf and corner. So I think we have a long way to go as a nation mm -hmm. in, uh, to, to totally eliminate ele electoral related violence. It, it comes to the doorstep of everyone, right. the electoral management body, security agencies, and even the citizens. We need to come to terms with the reality that we need to conduct ourselves in a way that will reflect that we're peace loving, that yeah. we tolerate each other. Otherwise, we'll be going around in circles and we'll achieve nothing. Okay, and, and I mean, it, it also goes to, you know, talk about the we would want to touch briefly on some of the recommendations that were accepted mm. and mm. those that were rejected. Mm. And then we can look at um, how this fits into the broader picture of 2020. Mm. Because the concern, one major concern that came up was the structure, the chain of command yeah. sure. when it came to issues of security. So we had a national security minister, we had the minister of defense, we had the SWAT team, we had the, uh, you know, police. Yeah, and then the police. police. So various security different security sectors had to appear before the commission now one major question that i remember was uh, being asked clearly was who was reporting to who mm. you see whose authority or order was final and which ones do you pick and which ones do you leave out you know and if you listen the to minister also, or the operations uh, commander exactly and, and so those and are the concerns some of the concerns that and if up. you look at the white uh, for instance one of the major things that were um, if I should say trashed by their government, mm. was um, the fact that the commission said there wasn't a clear um, guideline as to the com um, chain of command yeah. of the national mm -hmm. security minister yeah. in all these yeah. things. You know, but we all saw how these lapses contributed to the violence that happened yeah. in yeah. Iowa's West yeah. Warburg. And I think that this is a very serious thing that we have to look at going forward into 2020 because we are going to see maybe more of these Maxed individuals, mm. and you know that government also rejected the fact that the commission described these maxed individuals or security personnel as militia. <laughs> you know, so, so, I, so, so to them, to they are them, militia, and they are with the SWAT team. Yes. And we, we, we also saw yes. um, the level of um, uh, professionalism, uh -huh, okay. if yeah. I should put it, or unprofessionalism <laughs> of, the SWAT, of the SWAT team. Yeah. One of the recommendations of the um, commission was for uh, DSP as to be dealt with, yes. but we've not seen anything like that. Mm. Yeah. There, there were supposed to be prosecutions, there were supposed to be um, financial compensations to yeah. some of these people yeah. who were victims to the gunshots that happened over there, okay. and none of these things have been done. I think that you know, we, we have a long way to go. We um, we've done we've done the, the right foot thing by setting up the commission, but if we don't implement some of these um, high quality recommendations and we yeah. trash we trash it, then we are maybe back to square one. The if I question it people will ask then is, God forbid, and I'm praying hard against any kind of violence again going into 2020, before, during, and after the elections. However, in the extreme case that something happens, when a government says it is going to set up a commission of inquiry or anybody for that matter to investigate, are we going to trust whatever final reports they will put out. Should see, we trust? I mean, I, this, this question is critical and underlines the fact that many people see commissions as mere window dressing. Mm. Because if a commission sits and conducts its work and comes up with recommendations and you pick and choose, 
which of the recommendations you find relevant? That's a big question. 58% so, is more than half. Exactly. Yeah. So it means that you set up a commission, you empower them to do the work you wanted done, right. the work which you couldn't do because of conflict of interest issues. <laughs> and you gave them powers of a high court. Yes. And then they do that. And you pick and choose. And you, you strike off almost half mm. of the recommendations they made. That actually feeds into the mind of the people that perhaps we, we commissions are just okay. window dressing modes um, in order for us to throw that into everyone's eyes. I want us to help our viewers also understand, you know, the chronology, mm. you know, the chronology of events as of the day happened. Yeah. Then we'll yeah. come back to the final question or the final bit of, we've passed a vigilantism <coughs> law. No. Then there are these recommendations mm. also made by the commission. Mm. What should the commitment levels be from all the political parties? Also, uh, you know that the, um, the, there's a Peace Council mm. has been holding several yeah. meetings with these yeah. stakeholders to make sure that at least both parties, especially, mm. commit to uh, you know, a roadmap that would help us not you know, be recounting some yeah. of these stories. So let us go to the touch screen now and then take our viewers through a number of the uh, recommendations that were made, those that were picked and then those that were uh, rejected. Then we can, you know, put it to better perspective um, how the things have gone so far. So here's a background. Of course, we know that uh, coming Friday will be a year, exactly a year. We are told the NDC will be holding a forum of a sort to, to have a, um, a deba sort of to talk about it. The violence mad, and then on the sixth of February, uh, the three-member committee uh, commission of inquiry was set up, chaired by Justice Emil Short. Now, these are the terms of reference, and I read them out earlier. And then also, um, these were the, some of the, after the hearing, here were the, these are the names of some of the persons that appeared before the commission. The SWAT commander, DSP Azugu, National Security Minister Kandapa, and then Brian Echampo, or the minister, so a minister and his deputy. Then we have the IGP, uh, David Asante to then IGP. Ningo Prampra, member of parliament, uh, was there, Sam George. He unfortunately suffered some violence uh, on the day. Government's white paper rejected the commission's use of the word militia in the report, saying that those that appeared there were not a militia or cannot be described as militia as the uh, commission put out. Government also rejected the findings that the SWAT team members committed criminal assault against certain members of the public. So that was also rejected, indirectly saying that the SWAT team did not. But then the various um, um, uh, submissions that were made before the commission clearly showed. And we also saw the videos, how they even heckled people who were trying to run for their lives. So then it brings this particular uh, rejection into question. Then also, government accepted a recommendation for the prosecution of Double. Uh, his name is Ernest uh, Akumia. Uh, but then rejected the findings to prosecute Mohammed uh, Suleimana, who slapped Sam George. That was a clear violation of not just a Ghanaian citizen, but a sitting member of parliament. So why are you saying that action should not be taken against someone who's done that? I mean, there's been back and forth about it. And, and the, the final bit, um, government uh, also passed the Vigilantism and um, Related Offences Act into law 2019. So these are uh, the uh, highlights that we pulled from that report. And then again, we are coming to look at the final bit of this, which has to do with the commitment levels yeah. being shown. Clearly, are they showing those commitments, the political parties, government, and then even members of parliament who also played a critical role in, at least because one of them was right at the center or the heart of this. They were quite open, you know, uh, they, they spoke very openly about this. Steve, and I, well, maybe this time around I should come to mm. Rosina. Um, have you seen enough commitment shown by the parties, right, from where the National Peace Council comes in, the, uh, the fact that there have been several meetings and then the, the, the passage of the Vigilantism and Related Offences Act? Um, I think that the parties for now seem to have bought into the arbitration, if I should put it that way, of the National Peace Council in order for them to accept, um, to go by this um, vigilante um, bill or yeah. whatever. But as I said earlier on, 2020 would be the test as to whether or not they still believe, you know, things happen. Between now and 2020, we have about 10 months more. And um, December to, um, elections, we have about 10 months more, and a lot will happen. For now, everything seems cool. We've not had any major um, elections or 
um, by election. Mm. So we can't tell much. But for now, I think that all is well. We just hope that as we are experiencing... On the face of it. On the face yeah. of, on the it, face of for it, now. it looks as Yeah, it. so let's, yeah, let's wait and see. Mm. Okay, yeah. let's wait and see. I mean, I, I think that uh, the various political parties in the lead up to all the... Uh, consultations or I should say uh, negotiations mm -hmm. that went on between the NDC and the MPP under the supervision of the National Peace, Peace Council was indicative that both sides were committed to right. uh, a, a situation that will eliminate these uh, kinds of things in our body politic and then a law has been formed. So obviously there appeared to be uh, some commitment coming from both sides. Mm. I mean, forget about the fact that they, well, don't forget about it, but don't make <laughs> a big deal out of the fact that the government uh, decided to reject some of the recommendations. It has gone on to send to parliament mm. a law which has been passed, which is enough commitment. What is better than a law? I mean, considering a law and recommendations of uh, a committee. And then uh, we also see the Peace Council going through and coming to an agreement and mm. having a communicate consensus mm. together from both political divides. So, uh, so far as I know, the best anyone can do is what they're doing. Uh, mm. They're showing us that at least they're committed to the process. But up to today, no, none of the parties have come out clearly to say they are banning uh -huh. political vigilante yes. groups within yeah. their fold. So that's, that's clear that they, they don't want to go the full haul. I mean, the NDC, for example, is making the one-year event a massive celebration sure. because it's a political capital. They go by the tagline, never again in mm. our political history. And uh, uh, the presidential candidate, former President John Dramani Mahama, is leading that, is yes. leading the charge. So, well, it's a political season, so you must take advantage but, but, but of these things. how do you work with a committee or commission's mm. report, or how do you commit to not being violent if consistently you have denied even having vigilantism vigilante groups in your parties the ndc has come out categorically to say that we don't have, we don't have vigilante groups in our party the mpp has done the same some claim some of these people are ushers yes they say they're ushers some of them are <laughs> personal vol volunteers, volunteers. Yes. so volunteers. if you give them all these accolades or mm. nice you describe them in these vivid yeah. words mm. how then do you but Martin, that, that, that clearly tells you that nobody wants to let go completely yes they are still holding of these, these militant these, yeah. elements within the political parties because they come handy yeah. when they need them they bring them to the fore i mean yeah. you you go to um polling centers and these people just by yeah. seeing them standing there and not doing anything mm. they intimidate you but that's supposed to be the job of the security agencies that to provide security, we have mandated state institutions that are supposed to do mm. that, mm. not party security. You can have party security for party events. Fair. But you know the resource. Yeah. Yeah. You know the resourcefulness of our national security agencies. Issues, mm. On national issues, you don't want to use party people or persons clearly yeah. affiliated or associated mm. with the party to say that they are providing security for who? You see, then what then becomes of the state agencies, you know, the state security agencies? And again, to my earlier issue of you not even showing that, yes, accepting that I have these people and I'm going to deal with them, so I'm going to disband them or talk mm -hmm. them through mm -hmm. changing their approach, mm -hmm. something like that. But even if right from the onset, you say, we don't have people like that in our party. We, we are peace yeah. love. Every party says they are peace loving. So yeah. who's causing yeah. the violence? Yes. Who's promoting exactly. the okay. violence? You know, these um, um, vigilantes, they are also helping the parties in other ways beyond the security. They are these um, the individuals who go to the grassroots, talk to the people. They organize these various fora that they do in these um, constituencies, places that the MPs or maybe the candidates in that particular area could not, not go. They mobilize go. the people, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how come it, diff it is difficult for them to let them go because mm -hmm. beyond the security, they provide other things. Maybe they come you can in, engage their they, they come in, in other handy. Ways. And you, these individuals too have expectations that I am joining Ma Martin's camp, uh, camp, I am helping Ma Martin get up there, Martin can get me into Maybe the you come in, you sort me out. You sort me out. You push yeah. me into you the know? security. So they, they also have expectations. So it, it's um, it's a a kind of symbiotic mm. relationship, mm. and that. Mm. I, I, we, we, we we both have something to um, we gain hope, from it. So yeah, we just hope that uh, at least both parties. We know that the 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 other smaller parties also say they have vigilantism, vigilante groups. 
you know, we've had some of the, mm -hmm. you know, something, something sharks. Mm -hmm. But then we hope that at least they are learning from those into, up there. Yeah, it's going into 2020's uh, December mm -hmm. polls. Wouldn't be recording any violence. Let's make this very smooth as a people. This is the, the Suns on TV3 News at 10. Stay with us. When we return, we'll be talking about the ambulances that have been released. Information come in and indicate that at least some lives have been saved already uh, by these new ambulances. Also, almost all the constituencies have recorded the arrival of their um, various ambulances. How can we maintain them? You and I, how can we contribute in maintaining these ambulances? Stay with us. We'll be talking about that shortly. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is The Stands. This time around, our next major issue we are going to has to do with the ambulance. So government on Tuesday, January 28, distributed over 300 ambulances to all, all constituencies under its one ambulance, one constituency initiative. The remaining 32 ambulances will be kept by the National Ambulance Service in Accra. Uh, while this is a major boost to Ghana's health emergency response system, Keeping the ambulances in good state remains an arduous task for managers of these ambulances considering the poor uh, maintenance culture in the country. On your screens you can see very beautiful shots of the ceremony yesterday and uh, these ambulances brought in by the government distributed already. Uh, of course, after intense pressure, uh, you know, creating hashtags and all just to make sure that people are saved immediately now that the ambulances are in. They have been distributed. The next step would be maintenance of these ambulances. And that is what um, Stephen Enti and Rosina Foster, who've joined me in studio, will be uh, sh talking about shortly. And then also the concern having to do with not just those in charge of the ambulances, but then you and I, how can we help? Also, the president did something quite major and significant, very significant, which was the launch of the uh, emergency number 112. 112. You shouldn't call that number and be pranking people because by doing that, you are blocking someone else who probably needs an emergency uh, service as of the time you're pranking. Steve, Rosina, yeah. um, very good news. Sure. To be honest, I am particularly proud about the fact that we have this to help our emergency, uh, uh, you know, our, our health sector. However, the concern for me now is issues of maintenance. So let's do all the praise singing and, and make sure that we, we give credit where it's due yes, and then yeah. come to talk about. I think issue. that um, to a large extent, um, the launch of the commissioner of these ambulances, 307, from 50 to 307, we've done a good That's deal. a huge, huge yeah, number. Um, as of 2016, there was one ambulance to 524,000 Ghanaians. Right. But now we have 84,000 Ghanaians enjoying one ambulance. At hmm. least those in each of the constituencies beyond Accra and yeah. Kumasi and its um, environs will yeah. also have um, access to these ambulances. Um, it's a good call anyway. Um, political party promises fulfilled. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of fanfare, which we were expecting anyway. <laughs> but um, I think that the issue about prank calls is something that we have to take very seriously. One, 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 two. Mm. The president mentioned the new number and, you know, Ghanaians, I don't know whether it's a Ghanaian thing or whatever, but we, we, we talk to the police, you know, they have their emergency numbers to the fire service and everything. Yeah. And then sometimes they, they refuse to go to some of these locations because people call and then they just, oh, I want to try and see if it, the number will yeah. go through. Yeah. Oh, um, is that the police? Oh, okay, then they will hang up. Then they hang up. You know, those things. So I think that is something that we should avoid. And I'm happy that the president stressed it so much. But um, the issue of maintenance, Whose business is it to maintain? Mm. The National Ambulance Service has done a human's job so far, training people and all that. But I hope that we wouldn't end up calling 112, asking for an ambulance, and then they would tell us there is no fuel. There's no fuel? Yes. <laughs> okay. You, you know, That's so a... these are some of the things that we have to make sure that um, they don't happen. Okay. They should be prepared at all times. Uh, especially in the nights, you know, some of these accidents, like the one that happened recently in the central region, yeah. Yeah, happened in the night. We lost a lot of lives yeah. and all that. So I think that they should be prepared. And it's good that they've given them the training that 
was needed mm. for them to man these um, ambulances. But with the maintenance, I think it will fall on the, I think it should be decentralized, really, so that um, each district or um, they have these zones will take care of it. Yeah. They'll have maybe um, monthly maintenance shadow or something. There should be a way around it yeah, so that it doesn't end up like most of these um, state the vehicles ones, yeah. that we see around and today there's a lot of fanfare the next three months you ask of it and the news is different okay yeah see? but but sincerely i mean uh we, you must know all know that uh, these ambulances which were commissioned are covered by warranties and service agreements oh, yeah. which means that uh, we're expecting that frequently they will be serviced and when i i remember that i spoke with the uh the the ceo of the national ambulance service professor zakaria and he did explain clearly that there are service zones across yeah, the yeah. country uh, so while the the ambulances are distributed according to constituencies that their yes. servicing will be done in zones so yes. the national ambulance service has zones. service centers mm -hmm. to service these ambulances frequently i mean this is uh, the, the the question the, the issue uh, rosina raised are uh, important that you call an ambulance and you hear they don't have fuel so we want to have assurances from the uh, national ambulance service and the ministry of health uh, whichever appropriate agency is responsible for uh, ensuring that these ambulances are at their optimum to ensure that they are serviced frequently to ensure that they get the the relevant fuel to operate you see so we know now that if you dial 112 for an ambulance you are going to get the service for free but eventually someone has to pay for it yeah. so we need to with time begin to ask the question who is going to pay for it how much is going to go into the the use of these ambulances how are they going to be utilized in these constituencies there's so many questions we don't know when the ambulance is dispatched to a constituency for example where is it stationed okay. is it stationed at a particular hospital mm. or is stationed at a, a sp particular service zone or a particular call center mm. when we know all these dynamics we will be able now clearly to tell uh, within the value chain where servicing will come in and where it will not but right. i am confident that with the trouble that the current administration has gone through to beef sure. up the stock of the ambulance service and remember that there were 275 constituencies but we had 307 ambulances, ambulances yeah. and when we spoke to the ambulance service they tell us that they will uh, allocate some of the ambulances to the uh, the offshore, the oil uh, jubilee yeah. fields, and yeah. then some at some major roads, including yeah. Aflao, Accra yeah. Kumasi, you know, so that they will dedicate ambulances for mm. some of these uh, flashpoints. Yeah. And, and, and just to add on to what, you, mm. what you've just said, I mean, uh, there have been the specific plannings that mm. have gone into this, mm. where we're told that now every constituency has a, a service station, an ambulance station. Yeah. So there's going to be a, a station at the constituency. Yeah. And then as time goes on, the president indicated in his speech yesterday that they know that the numbers have reduced in terms of one ambulance to uh, about uh, 84,000. But it's still not. It it's is still, still not, not enough, enough clearly. Clearly. Because, I mean, imagine you are in a constituency and 50 people need emergency services at a go. How are we going to respond it is, to that? It's too much. Ten people. Or two. There is or five. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's an emergency as of that moment. Oh my God. Who, yeah. who, what's the criteria in selecting yeah. who needed more? Who goes, who uh, goes first? Uh, so, so who, maybe yeah. they would call the nearest constituency then. Yeah, to see yeah. if so they're available. Th that's why uh, I'm saying that. I'm particularly happy about this because government has shown that they have considered all of these things. So yeah. although we do not have yeah. one individual to one ambulance, I, do not, mm -hmm. I don't think anywhere in the world we have that. No, one yeah. person to one ambulance, we, have, we, we don't have that. But at least we would have enough mm -hmm. ambulances in the system yeah. to help run around. Mm -hmm. And again, there's been deliberate consideration of the fact that one, when there is an emergency in a particular area, immediately the call comes through, mm -hmm. there's a system that will check to see the nearest yeah. ambulances yeah, ambulance because they have the yeah. electronics yes, yes. The network. Device yeah, and network. they tell us that they have a bird's eye view yes. of all 307 yeah. ambulances which is, which is really good which is so really that's cool. that a lot has gone into this hmm. you know i was part of those who were saying we didn't need uh, a massive fanfare to launch yeah. and then sure. what commission they are there to serve a certain yeah. people release yeah. them yeah. but i think from yesterday's event i've come to understand the need 
for mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the commissioning mm -hmm. and why it was such a big event. Really? Yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I mean, I, I, to, I, to, to I kept saying that, look, we can't take it away from the 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 MPP yes, right? because yeah. in the in the this is the biggest consignment of ambulances the in the yeah, fourth, yeah. in the fourth republic no, in the history that's of the good. country that's you know so I'm just that's reducing true. it to yeah. fourth republic you know <laughs> so I don't like I don't I don't want trouble so it's that, a, that a if we look at the fourth republic mm. this is the biggest it's deal a, so well cup. we grant them the 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 you know option to have fun a little yeah. to celebrate yeah. it but I, I remember that I spoke to Edward Curry one of um, our resource persons who said that look well, I mean they could they could have fun fun with it but what if what if they could cut back on the celebrations and put that money into getting Look, even one extra yeah. ambulance? Yeah, because there was a lot of resources yeah, poured into so organizing this. All of these have come on and gone. Yeah, I think yeah. that we should go past the fact that there was a fanfare and mm, now yeah. begin to look at the entire value chain of yeah. our emergency response yeah. system. And Martin, don't forget that ambulances alone don't constitute yeah. emergency response plan Absolutely, of the country. Yeah, yeah. So we need to be sure that all our uh, uh, other district hospitals Hospitals, local uh, health care delivery facilities, yeah. chip compounds, all work with a mindset of emergency mm. response. Absolutely. Because mm. as far as I know, when there is an emergency, how you receive care at the first point of call mm. is crucial Very whether you're going to survive or not. Yeah. So we need to look beyond the ambulances, I would say, mm. to ensure that we have a health system that responds efficiently to yeah. emergencies mm -hmm. and keep people alive. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also excited about the number of employment this ambulances have it's created. Create. Thousands yeah. have been employed so far and we expect that more people will be added on. So mm. I think that it's a good thing. Yeah, good and, 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 and then the fact, the fact that at least there is the promise sure. that other ambulances will be mm -hmm. broken. You know, there's a single largest fleet to be distributed in the country. And the maintenance culture, where now, uh, the, the question I asked, so in case there is an emergency and you and I uh, appear on the scene, mm -hmm. What do we do immediately? immediately? So now we need to do a lot more public engagement and public mm. education sure. that when you go and there's an emergency, call mm -hmm. the ambulance mm -hmm. first and then see what help or assistance you can give those people. And, you know, uh, we've had reports of the way those who come in to help Handle, handle these victims, the yeah. victims. Yeah. Sometimes I've led I mean, them yeah. to either being uh, killed or they, they either get dead yeah. or get they worsen severe their, they worsen yeah. their yeah. situation. Now, Martin, you and I know from other places we've lived before that in every workplace there is one person who is a trained first aider. Yes. One yeah. person. So if we are here at TV3, there should be one person okay. or two people, one in each department who is a trained first aider. Mm. And they event of any emergency, that person is the one to call Pretty upon. In. They will come in and provide emergency first aid if they need to do uh, compressions to mm, your chest, yeah. if they need yeah. to use a defibrillator before they call the ambulance. And in other places, the ambulance arrives at your doorstep maximum of eight minutes, yes. not more. Yes. I so, think that um, so, these things work best because if, as you say, in these um, developed worlds, you go to school and you are taking to basic first mm. aid. Mm. You learn how mm. to do CPR mm. and all that. Mm. But ours is a bit of a, you don't really see these yeah. things. Yeah. We don't uh, value we, them until somebody we, we dies. I think that we should inculcate <laughs> it in our <laughs> curricula and yeah. then teach yeah. these little ones. Yeah. And then those of us who are up here to maybe we can also. Well, we have a long way to We have a long way to improve our emergency response. So, in this context, government has done its bit. You and I also have a role to play. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that we uh, we do that and do it very well. This is The Stands on TV3. Stay with us. We'll be back with more. Thank you for staying with us. This is The Stands. And uh, just before we go into uh, what our takes have been for this week and uh, projection into next week, we we'll also want to quickly add that as part of the healthcare delivery system in, in, in the country, we would recall that under the NDC government, they also imported some eight well-fitted, well-kitted um, 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 mobile clinics. They are currently at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital and uh, we are told that immediately they want government to pay some attention to it. Yes, governance is a continuum. So in as much as we have these over 300 ambulances, these are also going to help augment the services of the health delivery system. So would appeal to the Ministry of um, Health and then government for that matter to look at these eight 
mobile clinics, see how best we can get them, revamp it, mm. and then add on to the fleet to serve the people of the country. Steve, how has this week been for you? What are your projections for, 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 for the coming week? Oh, well, I mean, uh, the biggest uh, deal for me uh, this week uh, has been the ambulance and the general emergency response systems. Mm. And the week we've had quite a number of issues back and forth in the media space. Uh, the electoral role electoral stands tall role, because yes, uh, today yes. mm. the former two former presidents mm. um, have also had their share or their take on the whether or not we need a new voters register. Yeah, and you know that while all these ambulances and um, electoral road discussions are ongoing and what I see as a, a bit of a distraction by the opponents to take the shine of the ambulances by reintroducing the eight mobile, I mean, I mean yeah. it's a political gimmick and it's fine, you can play it all right, but the whole lot of questions surrounding that one and they don't fit into emergency response they are mobile clinics yeah. so uh, their place in the health delivery system is not the same as the place of the ambulance, the ambulance uh -huh. so yeah. we can't compare but beyond all those things while that is ongoing you know that the ministry of uh, education is starting consultation over the sexuality education issue. Mm. I is mean, it coming back? Uh, well, consultations. Stakeholder consultation. So that is something that is coming up uh, within... The uh, comprehensive with, sexuality mm. education? No, more like sexuality education thing, maybe the way forward. Yeah. There, is a, there is a stakeholder engagement that has been announced by the Ghana Education Service wow. for that. I've forgotten the exact date. I could mm. check on my phone. But that is coming up. The, the point I'm making is that while we are busy discussing health, and discussing ambulances and discussion discussing elections and electoral role this one is it's gently leading. coming in <laughs> at our blind side before you know no, there'll yes. be a policy it's which we, a policy. we had no clue <laughs> about uh -huh. so <laughs> that's how it is so i i am going yeah. to keep my eye on, on it uh, from next week yeah. keenly very keenly and make sure that we get to the bottom mm. and uh, our agenda for uh, radio our morning show mm. has been focusing on road sell a little bit we'll step up the yeah. game uh, within the week to uh, get to those named roads etc yeah. etc yeah. and see what yeah. government is doing yeah. to get them yep. Uh, yep. back on Rosino. um the biggest thing this week so far has been the ambulance. The ambulance yeah, so I think that um, Steve has said enough, we all have said enough. <laughs> but from next week onwards, I think that there are a lot of interesting things that are coming up from the NPP primaries that are yes. going to stand. Yeah. Yeah. Nominations just opened and people are complaining that they are not getting these forms. forms. And I think it's interesting. I don't know why the NPP chose to do their primaries around that time. I don't know if the wounds would have been healed enough for them to go into the elections with their okay. unified front. So I think the NPP primaries is something that, um, and its Keep development is something that will be interesting. And, and then on the global front, the coronavirus, the coronavirus. I virus. think that is something oh. that we have to look at. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ghana says it has scans and all that at its entry points, but I don't think it, um, that is enough. Okay. America and the other um, Western worlds are quarantining people for weeks, Those areas. you know, okay. and we are only yeah, doing screen. I don't think we are doing enough. Yeah. I think that we should also quarantine. At least on, on that, we know that from. two hospitals, two hospitals have been dedicated yeah. solely to... Yeah, Hospital, yeah. yeah, and then the Tema General Hospital. Yeah. And I think so far so good so anyway, so good. but that. I think we could do more. We certainly can do more and uh, we are grateful that you made time to stay with us for the past hour. This has been The Stands. I am Martin Estiedu Data. I've been here with Stephen N.T., uh, co-host uh, Sunrise on 92.7, and then also Rosina Foster, editor at Onuya FM. Do have a good evening, and as always, stay positive. Bye for now.